everyone. Welcome. Thank you for coming out. Um, this is the portion that I'm going to kind of tell you a little bit about the pieces that you're going to hear tonight. So the first piece that you just heard was Fanfare for 13 Brass by Adrian Albert, and it was written in 1998. So during my research for one of my exam topics, which was based on uh, women composers and their wind, their wind chamber music, uh, I was kind of looking for a piece that I could include in my recital. And I had stumbled upon this piece, and I was really excited and really intrigued to have it on the program. So that's where this piece, uh, Fanfare for 13 Brass, came from. Uh, it was written by Adrienne Albert, and she is actually a vocalist who has worked with a, with a number of famous composers, including Gunther Schuller, Philip Glass, Igor Stravinsky, and Leonard Bernstein. Uh, Adrian had started composing uh, in around the 90s after she had finished her degrees and this piece that you had heard, Fanfare for 13 Brass, was originally written for the Hollywood Brass Ensemble and was first performed in a church for the Pacific Composers Forum. Uh, this piece was written to feature each of the brass groups as well as have a little bit of a jazz flavor. And this piece was such an honor to work on because I actually was able to contact the composer and work with her directly to kind of ask her questions about the piece. Um, she even listened to, to some of the recordings before we actually performed it for you today. So thank you, Adrienne, if she's watching. Um, <laughs> the next piece that you're going to uh, hear about is called Sparrows by Joseph Schwantner. Uh, Joseph Schwantner is an American composer and educator. His first instrument was actually the guitar, and you'll hear a little bit of a guitar color and sound in his music that he writes. He served on the faculty for Juilliard, Eastman, and Yale. He also won a Pulitzer Prize for Aftertones of Infinity for Orchestra, and he was also a Guggenheim Fellowship winner. He writes music for both orchestras and wind ensembles, as well as small chamber ensembles, which is the piece that you will hear today. The piece was written in 1979 for the 20th century consort. And the piece is based on the poems from The Autumn Wind by Isa. He applies these 15 haiku that's written up here to the vocal part that you'll hear from our soprano vocalist. He uses many musical elements in his piece. For example, open scoring, shared monody, static pillars of sound, crossfading of dynamics, unusual time signatures, Influence from, influences from Baroque, medieval Renaissance music, aleatoric music, he uses clock time. He also has the string tuned down a, a minor second, so that way the strings have a wider range to perform with. As well as the instrument, instrumentalists are required to sing as part of their parts, and sometimes sing and play at the same time. So this is just the first page of the score. Uh, kind of crazy looking, but it's actually very simple to understand once you dive into it. So for example, in this page, you'll see the open scoring. Notice that there's a lot of white open page here. This represents the open scoring. Also, you'll notice, we'll use the flute part as example, her part does not actually come into play until this part here. So he's trying to sh use music as art. Um, also on this page, you'll see a crossfading of dynamics, for example, in the harp part, the dynamics decrescendo here, while the piano part crescendo, crescendos into her part. You'll also see the unusual time signatures, and this is all over the score. So he uses the, uh, the number of beats on top, but he actually uses the exact rhythmic notation to tell you what beat is in the measure. So for example, that first one, is five beats in a measure with the eighth note getting the beat. On this next page, you'll see again the unusual time signatures here and here. And you'll also see the shared monody that he uses. For example, the flute part, or I'm sorry, the piano part plays the entire musical line while the flute and the clarinet part double what she's playing, but in a slightly diff different rhythmic pattern as it has the ties to accentuate different harmonies. There's also static pillars of sound, which is in the string part over here, that are varied with the dynamics as well as outlined by the harp part below it. In this page, you'll also see that the instrumentalists are required to sing. And they will be singing a couple of times in the piece, but this is just one instance. And as well, the string players are required to sing and play at the same time. This next page I wanted to show you just to show you the, the huge uh, 
variety of what the open scoring looks like. This is, a, this is if you could see, everyone plays here, and then there's nothing until they re-enter. And the, f the vocalist and the percussionist will play all throughout. This next page demonstrates um, his aleatoric music that he used. So in this measure, you will see that he uses X because there is no time signature at this point in time. He wants the musicians to play this musical phrase repetitively over and over again for 25 seconds worth of clock time. And during this entire section, he wants them to ad-lib this part a little bit. So at some point, you'll hear them play it faster or slower or softer or louder. So it kind of sounds a little bit chaotic at that point in time. So that's just a little bit about the piece. Um, in terms of why I selected this piece, in my time here at UW, I had uh, the fortune of taking a class in graduate choral conducting. And I wanted to inc incorporate some sort of vocalist or vocal ensemble as part of my program. So in my discussions with Professor Salzman, we had been looking for pieces to have a vocalist. And this is one of the ones that we came up with. And it combines uh, a vocal part as well as wind chamber uh, music as well and some strings. Now, uh, the vocal soloist on this piece is Gemma Baldwin, and she will be standing over here, and you'll be able to hear her part, and she's got a beautiful voice. So without further ado, I'm going to invite all of the instrumentalists and the vocalists on stage, and we're going to play for you Sparrows by Joseph Schwanner.
Dvorak, serenade number two in D minor, opus 44. Dvorak is one of the most significant nationalist composers in Europe who popularized Czech music. As a nationalist, he infuses Czech influences into all of his music. This serenade that you're about to hear is one of two serenades that he had written, one being for the strings and the other being for this wind chamber combination that you will hear. This piece was premiered in, by the Czech Theater Orchestra with Dvorak actually conducting the premiere. The length of this piece is similar to that of Mozart's Serenade in B-flat, also known as the Grand Partita. And the instrumentation is a little bit different than uh, normal wind chamber music as it doesn't have any flutes involved in this piece. Um, the movement one is gonna sound a little bit like a Baroque sounding march. Movement two is where he infuses his Czech music with a triple meter Czech-like dance. Movement three sounds uh, quite familiar, kind of like Mozart's Adagio from the Grand Partita. And movement four is kind of a fast paced finish to the end with a recall of the A statement from movement one. Now I chose this piece for the concert because I wanted to include a standard uh, classic sounding uh, wind chamber music on the recital. And this is one of the pieces that I really love and I really enjoy uh, conducting and, and the musicians really enjoy playing. So for the last piece, I'm going to invite the performers out to perform Dvorak Serenade Number no. 2 in D minor.
I go, I just have a couple of thank yous that I want to say, so bear with me. <laughs> First to uh, my professor, Professor Salzman back there, uh, Dr. McDavid, Dr. Morrison. Uh, they've been unbelievable mentors and support system for me. Uh, they've always challenged me to think bigger and to believe in myself, and I thank you for that. Uh, to all the performers here on stage and also out in the audience and outside, um, I will forever be grateful to you guys uh, for loaning your time and your talents to my recital, so thank you so much for that. Um, also, I'd like to thank all those who kind of helped out behind the scenes. I don't know if you can see everybody, but Josh Chan, Eric Quach, David Marksbury, Sarah Randall, Lauren Hepburn, wherever she is. Um, thank you for that. And also to my fabulous uh, conducting cohort. You guys have been a great support system and kind of pushing me forward. So Mark, Doug, Tina, Ross, Lauren, thank you. Um, I'd like to also thank uh, Donna and Her Henry, who are here from Washington, uh, kind of like our Washington family. So thank you for all that you guys have done for us. Uh, I'd like to thank, I don't know where they are, my mom, my dad, my brother, and his girlfriend uh, for all their love and support and for traveling all the way from New York to come see the recital. So thank you. Uh, my husband, Brian, <laughs> Just coming all the way out here with me and, you know, believing in me and supporting me. Sorry, I'm getting emotional. Uh, <laughs> um, my apologies if I forget anybody in particular. But I do want to thank you all for attending, especially those via live stream. Hi, everybody from home. Um, there is a reception in the fishbowl for everyone, and we welcome all of you. And I will see you down there. So thank you very much for attending. I appreciate it.